Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to Shop Talk. Tonight I'm joined by my co-host Glenn. How are you, Glenn? I'm doing well, Dave. Now we've done some audio changes. You've got a new mic. We're using a new system on your end, and hopefully the uh, editing will also achieve perfection in the set time around. We'll be much closer. We'll see how the audio sounds. Yeah, we've been getting some feedback on that, so we're we're continuing to pursue it. Still open to feedback, and hopefully we're making improvements. So, well, what what do we got on the agenda tonight? Uh, I got a bunch of questions. You got okay. anything you want to kick it off with, or should we just dive in? No, I can tell you about my week, I guess. I spent most of the week working on an IBM 5155. Somebody donated it to the channel probably six months ago, and there's a humorous story with the keyboard. So when I worked at IBM as an intern back in college, the PS2 had just come out, and the IBM salesman came around, and he was just extolling the virtues of, of virtues of this keyboard and how indestructible it was, dustproof, waterproof, all kinds of stuff. And to prove it, he went over to one of the lady's desks and he grabbed her Diet Coke off her desk and poured it in the keys. And then he went in and kept typing and it all still worked. So we were suitably impressed. The keyboard didn't work the next day, but we figured that was because the keys were all stuck. But um, So long story short, I get this guy donates this model. Uh, well, it has a Model F style keyboard. It's a little bit modified from the Model F for the portable PC, but internally it's a Model F mechanism. And I figure, well, I want to clean this thing, so I'm just going to take it to the sink. And I get the brush and the soap, and I just run it under the hose because I figure, hey, they're waterproof. What could I do? Well, yeah, the Model M might be waterproof, according to legend. But I can assure you the Model F is not, in fact, waterproof in any way whatsoever. And naturally, it did not work. And I took the whole thing apart, which is a bear on its own. But I got it apart, dried everything out, used IPA or isopropyl alcohol to clean it and got everything, but they're so hard to assemble because they're a whole membrane system. And then there's a spring loaded curved piece of metal that clamps on in about nine or 10 places around the perimeter of the whole thing. And it's obvious that a machine does this on a factory line. It just goes whomp and bends the tabs, but to do it by hand and get all the keys in place in the right order. And if you make any mistake, you know, they pop out of place and it's another 30 minutes to get it lined up again. So, I uh, eventually gave up on that mechanism, bought a spare new Model F, and then transferred the guts over to this one. So it's got a brand new keyboard, which is nice, which is what I was going for because I just didn't want a dirty old keyboard. And uh, <clears throat> what else? So this thing's also got the 9-inch amber monitor, which I had an NOS or a new old stock example of a year or two ago, but I didn't have a PC portable, so I didn't hang on to it. I used it and converted a PET over to amber with it. Now I've got a PC portable, it might be handy to have a spare brand new monitor for it, but I guess I could still take it out of the pit. But um, The next problem was the hard drive. It's got an ST251 MFM 20, well, it had a 10 meg drive in it, a Micropolis that had failed, and it had failed so badly that it would just blink, and that was with no cables attached except power. So, And that's how I got it. So it was clearly already failed when I got it. So I ordered off eBay, and I've been through about, between the PDP-11 and this, I've been through about seven or eight Seagate ST251s and 255s trying to find a good set of drives because most of them are just untested. You try it and, well, there went 60 bucks. Um, I did buy some guaranteed ones and one of the two worked. So I got that low level formatted, which took me several hours because I would just run F disk and expect the drive is going to show up. But no, you've got to uh, run debug and jump into the ROM monitor and go to address C800 colon five. <clears throat> oh, but first you have to load the AX register with the drive number in the upper four bits and the interleave of the sectors in the lower four bits. So you load the, or maybe it's eight bits, and you load the uh, AX register with that. Then you jump to the address and it starts just low level formatting your drive. So, yeah. Just Did that. Simple. And then I was able to F disk it. Just simple process like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I have done that in the past, but it's been 30 years since I've done that in the past. So, I had posted on the Hardware Junkies forum on Facebook, which is a really great resource. And somebody in there even remembered, I think, C800, which I found in the manual once I looked up the part number. But long story short, I was unable to F disk it. And then when I went to format it, it said bad track zero, can't use disk. So I went to the second drive, repeated the entire process again, this time formatted and F disked it, and it worked until I reassembled the machine. And then it didn't work anymore and was having seek errors and stuff. 
My only guess is that once it was torqued into the frame with all the mounting bolts, maybe that threw it out enough that it had to be low level formatted again because I repeated the process a third time and it's been solid ever since. So, uh, so once it was in situ and secured in the machine, you've yeah. been able to stabilize it. Yeah, it's wow. in the same orientation. I did have to take the belt sander to it. Um, <laughs> Because the the bezel, that black plate that goes on the hard drive, was a little too wide to go into the IBM portable PC. It has a slightly narrower window, so I had to shave some off each side. And did that, and it fits nicely. But that might have also thrown it off. Who's to say what throwing a disc or a belt sander at your drive will do to it? That reminds me of that little, uh, I don't know what you recently saw, TikTok or some little short um, with the the. the the grinder wheel and the the different metallic uh, credit cards that you had. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of fun just to see what it looked like when we cut them with a wheel and cut them with a saw. Yeah, and... Yeah. yeah, and cut them with the wrong piece of equipment. And yeah, you know, that titanium one sure makes a nice sound when it drops on the floor. That it does. It's a dead. Why well, drop it every time I use it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, fumble me. <laughs> Boom boom. I think there is a sound effect button here. We're not going to use that. Um, you want to fire into some questions here, Mr. Plumber? Yeah, let's do that. Like okay, I'm going to go again. We'll start with your new Windows episode here, sort of one from a week ago. Uh, Tom Trottier, do you really need 60 frames per second? My poor old TV can ha only handle YouTube at 2160p at 30 frames per second, and I want to see all the details. Well, I'm, I figure it should be preserved for the ages for future historians to analyze. And so I've done everything in 4K60 just because of yeah. that. But, uh, yeah. you it's know, I think it'll bounce samples so if you have primarily. A, yeah. I figure there'll be 3D versions of me, you know, generated by AI. They might as well at least be close. So, Well, it might even be in your voice, too. Yeah, I was playing around with 11 Labs, and uh, I did the professional training. What I did was to take... The audio or the uh, video files that I've rendered for the episodes use FFmpeg to extract the audio channel starting three minutes in because I often have some music in the first minute or minute and a half. I didn't want that. So then I got, you know, 20 examples of episodes of the narration lasting about 10 minutes on the average, uploaded all of those into 11 labs and paid for their professional processing. And you have to do a voice verification to make sure it's really you and all these other steps. Did that and uh, it was pretty convincing. So I think I'll do maybe a little episode on that, show what the results were. and Because uh, I was surprised. It's enough that my family is a little spooked out by it. <laughs> right. So I made the little video today saying, if you get a recording like this where you can't interact with me, but it sounds a lot like me, it could be AI like this. And then I sent it to them. Wow. that That's probably a good test. Yeah. And it, I don't know if it would have fooled them because it wasn't trying to, but... Right. Yeah. But if they're, if you can sort of satisfy them that it reasonably sounds like your voice, um, that's right. probably a pretty good audience test that, you know, others who are, I'm going to say most of your audience is probably less familiar with you than your family. I mean, just a guess, but. Uh, probably. Yeah. Although all the audio sampling <laughs> is based on the way I speak in episodes, which that's is right. going to be naturally a little different than I do just day to day. So, yeah. However, that then goes to support that again, that if folks, if you're going to do some sort of audio presentation that or audio version of your book, the folks that are hearing your voice are going to be used to the voice that you present when you're on your YouTube channel. So even reinforces it that way. So, Yeah, and I actually tried the audio book to see if it could read the audio book and do it well enough that I could in good conscience sell an audio book, you know, with the, obviously indicated that it was generated by AI, but um, would it be a useful product? And the answer is almost, you know, it's really good until it comes to something like MS DOS and it says MS DOS or whatever. And you would have to go through and manually listen and edit and add inflection points, maybe where you felt they were important. So by that time you might as well just sit down and record it. So yeah, one day I shall, or I shall have somebody else do it yeah. soon. There you go. There you go. Okay. KKODJ, another great video. I wonder why this release and she's again, we're talking about the new windows here. Uh, I wonder why this release didn't give back the Windows 10 start menu. I believe that tens of millions of users would love to see that change. Yeah, I don't know if it peaked with Windows 10 or Windows 7 or what episode of Windows has the best start menu, but uh, I mean, I'm partial to XP. So because <laughs> at least I understand, understood how it worked and I knew how to customize it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, 
I'm surprised that Microsoft messes with the start menu and I, I'll dare say compromises it as much as they do by adding advertising and sponsored links and all kinds of stuff in there. And I think, again, it comes back to Windows is now like a free commodity and they have to monetize it somehow else because people don't go to the store and pay 99 bucks for a copy of Windows anymore. They just use an old product key and they allow that. And so it's de facto free for most people. Um, is the business side alone enough to carry it? I don't know. Apparently not because they're monetizing the heck out of the consumer side. So I still wish you could buy like Windows Pro and it was two ninety nine and had no telematics, no... Uh, advertising information, no ads, no sponsored links, no half installed applications, none of the bloatware. I, or even, you know, 30 bucks a month or maybe not that twenty four ninety nine a month, <laughs> nineteen ninety nine a month. I'd do that. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to monetize it, um, I think there's a, an audience for folks at that level who would certainly pay to, you know, a reasonable amount monthly or annually, what have you to lose some of those annoying little features. And that's, uh, then you're actually sort of a, attracting not attracting you're just disappointing less customers i guess because those that yeah, want especially it for... if it's the if it's the pro version because then you're presuming that that audience doesn't want cookie creator 3000 the demo version yeah next to their and, autocad or whatever and for users like my mom <laughs> all that stuff is irrelevant to her and she yep yeah, she can you can bombard her with that stuff all you want she's fine yeah so uh, okay still wolf 13 He's quoting you here, Dave, I don't have a Windows Copilot PC. And then me, wait, what about that 50,000 PC, $50,000 PC that was running chat GPT a while ago? Yeah, you certainly think it would be technically able to do it. But in order to run the new Copilot stuff or any of the Copilot Plus stuff, it requires an NPU that has a certain performance level of teraflops, uh, per, uh, teraflops. And I don't know what it is. I forget if it's like 10 teraflops or some number that you have to achieve. And it has to be in an NPU and in a certain format. And the new, was it Snapdragon CPUs apparently have that? I don't think the new Intel Core Series 200 has it. So, I mean, it may have an NPU, but I don't know if it'll match up with Copilots. Yeah, and that, that PC, that $50,000 one, that's a couple of NVIDIA graphic cards and a pretty fancy chip that are doing that, but they don't have the NPU potential, so... Yeah, but I would imagine, it. like you said, it's got the dual ADA or RTX 6000 ADA cards. Right. And I'm pretty sure it could handle it. It would just have to be written for it, and it's not. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert Major, or MGR, um, why do you think Microsoft made Windows Recall a dependency on 24H2 for File Explorer? So it looks to be a service that can, can't easily be deleted, and that, quote, remembers everything you do in your computer, according to Google. Right. I don't know why it's a permanent dependency of File Explorer. You think they could dynamically load it for a feature that's not necessarily always going to be on, but it's also easier to statically link to it, I suppose. Um, in terms of you can turn it off with the DISM, and I don't even know what DISM stands for, but D-I-S-M is the PowerShell command that allows you to, or distribution manager maybe, to go in and turn off and on Windows features from the command line. And so the thing is you can turn off Recall, but it's still loaded as a dependency of File Explorer. And I don't know the answer to why that is, so I can't answer which I, what I assume to be the root question there. But I guess I'm cautioning that you can turn it off, but it's still loaded because it's a dependency. So what it does if it's loaded and disabled, I'm going to guess it does nothing, but... It's still there. Yeah. So well, that, that so at QKB here, then it says, hey, Dave, can you tell us how to get rid of Recall and Copilot? <laughs> Beyond turning it off with DISM, yeah, uh, no, that's that's the best that I can suggest. Okay, um, Jibuno Cage, did they add the greater sixty-four bit support for ZIP? Um, there are a few sixty-four bit specific ZIP encoding variants that were once not supported. Um, and then he says GZIP exposes a number of those encoding variants on Linux, and they still seem to be unsupported by Windows eleven. Oh, really? I'm surprised they're not supported by the GZIP code in Windows eleven. I'm not surprised that Windows Zip doesn't support it because it looks like Windows Zip is a special case. So it's probably still the exact same stuff I wrote and that I linked to in 1995, largely. And in order to keep backwards compatibility, if you open or modify or create a zip file, you're going to use my old code. Whereas if you're going to touch a gzip, tar, rar, or any of those files, it goes down the new code branch. 
And it doesn't look like you can drop into them, as I pointed out in that one video. And somebody was asking me about that, why that is. Like, why can't you add to a gzip file? But a gzip file is a compression of a single file. So it doesn't make any sense to add a second file to it. Tar, I could understand. It would be really nice to be able to assemble tars through drag and drop. But for now, you're stuck with zip. And you're stuck with old zip, which is not multi-threaded. And because um, there weren't really multi-threaded CPUs at the time. And... It generally works, but it's not fast. Yeah, so I'm going to jump ahead here. So, uh, <laughs> and he's hacking Slack. Uh, it says, I'm not surprised you can't drag a file into a GZIP file. GZIP only really compresses one file. That's why okay. it's combined with tar. Yeah. Um, and then he says, you didn't show uh, trying to add a file to a RAR. He said, interesting that the GZIP file had a name stored inside. How does that work? Was it actually a TGZ? No, it may have just been the same name as the outer file without the .gz okay. uh, suffix. That's going to be my guess. Okay. Um, Ankar Jagpal, does the zip support now allow decryption of password encrypted zips? No, it used to when it was still a shareware app. But when they put it in the system, they took out that functionality. I think, I don't know the honest, or I don't know the authoritative reason why, but my honest guess is that it's because they didn't want to support people losing their password. There's no way to back up the key. They're going to encrypt something, and then they're going to lose the key and the password and call Microsoft to want the data back. Plus, at the time, encryption was considered a munition under U.S. law because it was subject to export prohibitions, so you couldn't ship more than a certain bit strength of encryption to places like Russia. And... uh don't know what the zip compression equates to in terms of bit strength, but I'm guessing they just didn't want to have any other encryption. Or did I say compression? I meant encryption. Uh, they didn't want to add any encryption to the box. Okay. Um, erroneous L. Did they change the zip encryption to support AES-256 yet? It's a shame that the native zip support has used a fairly easy-to-crack encryption method for so long. Yeah, it's, it's still using the one that's compatible with the old original zip format and it has not added any of the newer stuff because the code that it actually uses to interact with the low-level zip file was probably snapshotted at the time and is still shipped the same code. So there's no improvements going on there. Okay, Paul Bennett, uh, what's the state of multi-part RAR support? I've only seen one extractor that handles all variants properly. You get one guess which it is. Uh, WinRAR? <laughs> um, you know I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to suspect that the answer depends on what the shareware, or not shareware, the open source library that they've incorporated for RAR support. If it automatically knows to follow the links and you know look for part two and part three and so on, it could certainly work. It wouldn't matter to the UI portion that behind the scenes, the encryption code is talking to multiple files. So there's nothing preventing it from working. Whether it does work or not, I don't actually know. Um, dude, 420 in Portland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, Dave, is there a way to have Windows 10 or 11 preferentially show search results for local apps and files over the web results? So it it's gotten to the point that search functions essentially useless at this point. But I wondered if you knew a way to un screw this poop show <laughs> that that, that's a, not that a direct quote, quote. I've, no, I've, okay. yeah, I've, <laughs> um, short answer no and I, yeah. I i am just struck by how useless the windows search remains to this day when there is a full content indexing engine running in the background and it's indexing all your documents and your mail and um it's just exposed in a terrible fashion and I mean, Google is better at auto predicting what you're typing than the start menu is, which surprises me given the limited problem set of start menu commands. But um, yeah, it surprises me. But I think the answer is no. Yeah. And, and I'm, the, I'm, the best I'm thing like, I've seen in a long time, sorry to interrupt. No. On, at least on the Windows side, or not Windows, on the PC side, would be Magellan from like 1993 it was a text-based system that would index your whole hard drive and it just gave you instant search to the whole an instant search on a 286 in 1993 so it was really well done lotus made it i believe and uh i've never seen anything that worked quite as well you know for its time anyway yeah and instant using the word instance relative <laughs> yeah talking to 286 and 35 years ago um the search tool on the mac os 
I mean, it's been a while since I've been allowed to go on my wife's uh, iMac, but um, but it's not always seemed anymore. to be excellent. Yeah, the only thing I find that it doesn't search is it's not great about searching the email. It does, but it doesn't find things as often as I find as I would like. It's not good about searching for stuff in a particular folder, but it'll find you know across the whole system stuff really rapidly. But it doesn't seem to search OneDrive or network locations. If I could get it to index my network share, I'd be fully happy. So if you know how to do that, please let me know in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll do an episode. Um, uh, user pi 3 nf as much as I loved the old days after Windows 7, I was done with Microsoft. I really don't like the bloated ad data collection machinery that it became. There is no reason not to switch to Linux other than gaming. Would really like to hear your opinion about it. Now, he kind of talked a little bit about the Addy stuff. So, Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the adware stuff. Or not adware, but the ad-sponsored links that have been added to the system and all that. So I think I've been pretty clear about that. In terms of bloat, I mean, obviously the operating system has gotten bigger. I think they are pretty careful about it, believe it or not. And the thing is, what matters to me is how that operating system works on your average contemporary hardware of the day. And it's still a great experience if you put Windows on any kind of halfway reasonable computer. It's a snappy and it's a responsive and it's, it's a great experience. Now, there's some things I don't like about it as well, but I think by and large, it's a great experience, so... I don't think you can complain that it's bloated unless it's slow. Yeah, it's big, but I mean, you've got literally a thousand times as much RAM as you used to have. So the fact that it's 18 times bigger, it's probably more than 18 times, but. <laughs> Where did 18 come from? I don't know. Like Task Manager was 100K or 86K in the NT351 or 40 release, and now it's four megabytes. And so yeah. that's quite a bit of growth. It does a lot more. It's got graphics and pretty stuff and all that. But and, and again, it's it's surfing a pretty wide consumer base and skill yeah. and preferences. Um, again, there's plenty of folks that are using very little of its potential. Uh, and a lot yeah, of I'm not extra. I'm not slamming task manager no. for having gotten fat so much as I'm saying everything has grown, and that's just one example of how much. Yeah, I'm, have I'm grown. talking about the entire Windows sort of package and the bloat there, and again that, and again I think that's back to that piece. If you got that pro version, you know, and right. it's ad free and there's a fee to it, there may be folks that would you know be willing to pay to get rid of some of that stuff and and free up and just have what they need. But yeah, it's it's sort of what is there two versions of it. Windows and Windows Pro? <laughs> well, there's Home Pro. There used to be Server. There okay, used to be Advanced right. Server at one time. There used to be Enterprise. Data but Center. But for most of, your, most of your sort of typical users, though, other than the sort of the corporate and the enterprise system stuff, it's, it's the Home Most people are running Home, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, Or maybe um, Pro. But. Yeah. Um, Paul Bennett, uh, Eco Mode. If there's one more thing, or if there's one thing that annoys me more than Recall... But does not worry me more than it. It's eco mode. Is there a turn off all eco mode power saving auto turbo garbage and keep it turned off button? Uh, yeah. If you go into power settings and you go to power schemes, there's an other or advanced option at the bottom because you'll have like three options or maybe two or three options you can pick from like power saver and balanced right. and economy. Yeah. And then there's another one that says, you know, advanced or whatever. You click on it and it pops down. And then your eco criminal choice of max performance is under a secondary menu and you turn that on and then you won't get any ecological eco criminal yeah <laughs> it's not labeled well, on a laptop though. yeah no. yeah yeah uh wood stove enthusiast has microsoft fixed the right click menu in explorer for windows 11 what was wrong with it i don't know right click know. menu in explorer for windows 11 Come on, man. You've got to ask a question. You've got to be specific enough that I can answer yep. it. You can't just yep. say, why does it suck? Make it better. Come on, wood stove enthusiast. Throw another question in there. Amp it up. Uh, Put a log on the fire. <laughs> <laughs> He's busy chopping wood. Um, Ark Rainer. Uh, were you using a virtual machine to access 24H2? Yes. Uh, He's got a couple questions here. So the answer oh. to that question is... <laughs> yes. Uh, what was the top toolbar on your screen? Probably the Mac right. session, which had the frame window from remote desktop, because I was remote desktop into it from a Mac. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. Um, and then he says, the adjustment for the GPO to speak to the storage device sounds like a good change. My next question would be, does that pose any security risk or increased wear on the GPU and storage? I don't think so. There should be no increased wear. The, the disk is not accessed anymore. It just allows it to bypass the CPU. So you're going to load, normally you're going to have the CPU will go byte by byte or stream by DMA data through channels to go from the storage device to the video card and load all your assets into memory. But with this, it just bypasses it and it uses, I'm guessing, direct PCIe, PCIe channels and goes right from the video card or to the video card from the storage device. So they're both being used exactly the same amount as they were before. It's just now like a more direct connection. Okay. Um, Ericon 9721. <laughs> I'm going to, I got to concentrate. Why was this sudo? Right, instead of sudo. Uh, why was this sudo command invented? We already had run as. No? Actually, no, it's sudo. It is sudo? Oh, right, yeah, do. Super user yeah, do. I said it wrong. I knew I was going to get it. I always get it backwards. Now, some have argued it's switch user do, but since it's super user implied, I think it makes more sense for super yeah. user. I realize there's also yeah. the su command, but. Um, so the run now that as? I've randomized me. Yeah. And the difference is that it assumes that you mean you plus administrative credentials if you type sudo. So if I launch sudo notepad, it's going to take Dave account and then promote it to admin and then launch notepad. But if I use run as, I have to specify what user and provide credential passwords. So it's a little more verbose. So sudo is mostly a simplification and a convenience factor, right. I think. Yeah. Um, True River, 1950. Dave, part of my autism is that I find it hard to adapt to change, especially when it's forced on me with no choice, even in if timing. Every autistic person is different, and I wonder if you have that trait. Yes, we're all the same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I hate change. That's a really common <laughs> autistic trait. And I think particularly change in people and situations. You know, you've come up with a plan, you've got a structure to your day, and you've got a way that you like doing things. And you've kind of learned by routine how to get through certain situations that don't come intuitively to you. And then all of a sudden the playing field changes entirely and all of your hard memorized rules and everything you knew on how to get along is no longer true. And that can happen to a certain extent with operating systems. You know, if you go through a major change and it doesn't work the way you used to or your favorite editor or your Tesla, now the heater controls are two steps away instead of one step away or something like that. I'm making that up. But something you use a lot when it changes, it's probably harder on somebody with autism than somebody that doesn't. It's a wild speculation, but I stand by it. <laughs> uh, Firecat with four sixes. Um, didn't Windows 11 already have the multiple desktops function, win key and tab? I remember seeing it all the way back in July or August last year when they started using Win 11. I was using Vista before. <laughs> it's a bit of a jump. goes back a lot farther than that, actually. I believe we had that in the mid nineties, because even when I wrote task manager, you'll notice that, well, I guess you won't, but I'll tell you that <laughs> when it enumerates windows, it doesn't just enumerate windows. It enumerates every window station in the machine. And on every window station, you can have multiple desktops and on each desktop, you can have multiple windows. Um, and so those, those concepts were already built in and there were tools in the internal SDK, if not the actual SDK to create multiple desktops and switch among them. Um, and that got fancier, but never, it might've shipped as a power toy at something at some point, but I was not aware of the win key tab. I'll have to give that a try and see if it works. <clears throat> so moving on to the Stuxnet questions now, uh, rocket ranger, a naive question from my side. Why do you need a special version of windows for controlling the speed of step motors? Can't it be also handled by a Raspberry Pi or even Arduino connected to a whatever computer system? Or, sorry, to a whatever system computer? Well, you don't need a special version of Windows necessarily, but you probably need the power of a PC if you're going to monitor 10,000 centrifuges, because I would imagine that monitoring 10,000 centrifuges from a Raspberry Pi might be a little challenging. I suppose it depends how efficiently it were coded. I'm not saying it's impossible, but if you gave me that task, I would probably start with a powerful desktop CPU in order to manage that kind of load. So... I imagine that's why they were running desktop PCs in order to communicate because they're not necessarily um, doing the work. They're talking and delegating to the PLCs, but they can be talking to a lot of PLCs. So it's volume. Yeah. How do we do it? Volume, volume, volume. That's right. 
Location, location, location. Uh, Jordan Cobb, how does an air-gapped system receive updates or report to command control systems? I don't know how it would report back in an air-gapped case, but you could imagine that for the infection, if there's an updated or a new payload or new command and control strategy for the malware, that say a new one gets brought in three months later on a different USB key, it'll use its internal peer-to-peer network to spread and update everybody in place. So I assume it's within and it requires a new infection to introduce new software to it. Unless it, I mean, it can't magically phone home. So <laughs> that I can't think of a way. So yeah. I was going to say unless, but no. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is Brian's, like there's more than one of them or Brian S. Um, hey Dave, love the channel. Do you know if Microsoft has internal hackers uh, that try to circumvent uh, operating systems and application security measures prior to and after release. Seems that would be a good thing to do. I know they used to. I don't know what goes on now. I know they got rid of a lot of the test apparatus. So you used to have dedicated engineers and then dedicated testers that would try to break your components and find ways to do whatever it was to make it do what you didn't expect it to do. And they did that for security as well, of course. But now they've gotten rid of a lot of the testers and developers have to self-test. I assume that's not true for security, but I don't know. Yeah, right. Uh, BX Danny. So is there a simple way to stop Windows from responding to those autorun.inf files? If not, why not? It might not have worked in this case due to those zero-to exploits, but since they have presumably been fixed, it would now. Um, if there isn't, is Microsoft keeping that vulnerability open on purpose? Well, I don't think it is a vulnerability. There was a zero-day exploit that you could do a special auto run that INF that would exploit a bug in the link code that could then escalate from there. But um, I assume that's long since fixed. So, yeah, you can turn it off, though, if you want. You can run a group policy editor, which is gpedit.msc from start, or look for group policy editor. And it's it's under the machine policies for auto run uh, CDs on autoplay something like that, but it's under group policy for local machine policy. Yeah. Um, Matt Foytik, uh, could you talk more about your time working on auto run? Um, were the developers aware at the time of the huge security risk feature that could pose? Was it a trade off between usability for regular users and security, or was security an afterthought? You'd mentioned that you at did that some point, work on that. At the, so. Yeah. Uh, I didn't write any of Auto Run. That was actually when I owned it. It was a guy named Stefan did the actual coding on it. We well, just sort of talk about more about your time working on it. And I guess so. So you said you were the owner, but Stefan was really the guy. Who oh, was and did we stuff. understand whether or not it was like yeah, like be the trade off vulnerability? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were aware of you know boot sector viruses and that kind of thing, um, but I think there was a presumption at the time that when you put a CD in, it would do something. You didn't want to have a computer where you're Mom loaded a CD in and nothing happened whatsoever. And she had to use File Explorer to go in and find the XE on the disk and then launch it and so on. Um, so it makes sense to have the feature in terms of how cognizant that we were of how it could be exploited. Not very at the time, not until probably Windows XP Service Pack 2, Service Pack 3 era did we kind of get the religion when it came to security because there had been a couple of big worms. So before that, you would try to enforce security at the, you know, the kernel level and everything else, but it wasn't so much against malicious attackers exploiting users, putting weird auto runs on disks, that kind of thing. So, you know, certainly there came a time when that had to become a huge priority and it did. So, yeah. Uh, Chris M and uh, starts with a qualifier with all respect, Dave, <clears throat> you know, what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel a little bit guilty for your part in auto run? Um, <laughs> Again, I think your part in auto run was you were the owner of it yeah. uh, and someone else is doing that work. Um, you could talk to that, but uh, was it deliberately invented to assist bad actors? Uh, I'm going to guess no. It's an amazingly bad idea, just like automatic executables in MIME. It's a bad actor's wet dream and has caused the world significant harm. I would warrant more harm than good. So again, this is all respect, Dave. Yeah, do I feel guilty? No, I don't feel any more guilty than I think the guy who works on the construction crew who builds the overpass that somebody drops a rock off of and hits the car. It's not the fault of the guy who built the overpass in that case. It's the person who committed the, the bad act, which would be the person who puts the malicious auto run 
executable on the CD in the first place. Um, should you prevent it from ever having a mechanism? And I would say, yeah, you know, ideally today, if I was doing it, I would at least sandbox that app and restrict rights and so on and so forth. But it's a different environment than it was in 1996. So you kind of have to look at it in the context of the day too. That's the, yeah, that's a very important aspect that is easily overlooked. Um, Farmall Paul, Dave, did you work on Stuxnet? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny my participation right. in that project. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, Rohit Kadam. Hey, Dave, can you mention your sources in the description? Sources so, for? Well, I'm not sure if that's specifically related to the Stuxnet one or if that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they're getting at, but maybe we're looking for more information. Yeah, I'm not sure. For the Rohit. Stuxnet one, I read a book a long time ago. Okay. And I watched a couple of YouTube videos and I read the Wikipedia article, which is actually more detailed than the book I read. So, Wow. There you go. Uh, Wikipedia is very thorough and you, you know, you don't want all the information that's in there. It'd be a long episode. So I tried to kind of do the highlights and the interesting parts. And if it's more general than that, in terms of all your episodes, I don't imagine there's going to be any kind of bibliography or anything that's going to be coming in terms of. No, if I use other people's footage or images, I try to tag them either in the description or even on, you know, in the video, but uh, not for where I get my information usually, no. Okay. Oliver W. Douglas. documentary. That's right. Um, Oh, I I won't go there. Um, That was a very thorough overview of Stuxnet. I had no idea the level of damage so-called isolated systems could weather. Considering how far technology has evolved since then, it begs the question, is anything truly safe from a determined foe? Nope. Yeah. I would say not. Yeah. Um, from a dedicated nation state attacker, I don't think anybody can ultimately sustain an attack from that in any kind of way that your computer is still useful and it's in a useful environment. So you'd have to be so locked down that. We must be less insecure now than we were 20 or 30 years ago or somehow. Uh, oh, Yeah substantially yeah. right now the problem is some of the complexity and the legacy ways in which the devices the pc desktops are built because you don't have this level of issue with phones because everything is sandboxed everything is um run in isolation and so forth but you still have the issue because you had pegasus 2 and some of the other ones so again a determined nation state attacker was able to get through the apple iphone ecosystem so mm. So we're less insecure, but it's somehow some way actually more vulnerable when it does happen because we're tremendously more reliant on yeah. computers and technology than we were 30 years ago. So, yeah. Did I mention I got the stoned virus on my PC portable that I was talking about? No, I think you had something on Facebook, but yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Do you want I to talk about trouble that losing. Well, it's a good time since we're just talking about yeah. this, but I was just going to mention I was losing the boot sector and eventually found that it was because the stoned virus was doing something weird. I didn't, act, I think it's like one out of every five or six boots. It'll say your PC is stoned, but I have a XT IDE drive that has a BIOS banner that comes up right away too. So, um, I can't tell if it was printing anything, but when I ran the scan, sure enough, MSAV said your PC is stoned. So, and stoned, but that goes back to what? 19. Oh man. I don't know. Late eighties perhaps. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. It That's was really like, the first spread, or one of the very first spreading worms like that. Yeah, I was going to say it's like was in the top two or three or the first, second or third. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, the good old days. Um, Xyletes. This is the first malware we learned about in my MS cybersecurity course. Very cool. The question, um, unrelated to that, what's that helix light you got behind you? Or is that a green screen? <laughs> Cheers and thank you. Everyone likes no, that. They want to know about recall, co-pilot, and the Helix light, Dave. Really? <laughs> Maybe I should do an episode on the Helix light then. I just hate to build a second one because it was kind of a pain to build the first one. But yeah, it's, it's custom. I bought a white LED Helix lamp from Home Depot, stripped all their guts and power and lights and LED out of it. So I just used the metal frame and then ran my own LEDs. Oh, and their plastic diffusion covers. Ran my own... Uh, RGB LEDs inside, added a controller, ESP32, remote control, all that stuff. So 
The only problem was it's a weighted base and I was going to put all my electronics in the base and there is nowhere to put it. So I had to make a cup in which it sits. But I've still got the model so I could see it and certainly print a second one. So maybe I should build a second one. Yeah, it's just a, it was fun to do it the first time. <laughs> yeah, second, it's less fun doing it the second time. Yeah. <laughs> it turned out better often by the third time you do them. Yeah, yeah. I think we, do we want to mention anything that that's... Uh, that was for your daughter and then it broke and so you got it in the shop and there might be a an arm wrestling match going on if when yeah, she if wants it disappears, it back in her room. That's a good reason for me to build a second <laughs> one, I guess, right? And give her hers back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Mel Pacito, or Maplacito, sorry. Uh, I just always assumed that you are American, but the friendly giant reference at the end leaves me asking, Are you Canadian? Eh? No, no do the boat it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm from Saskatchewan. Uh, yeah, Regina, Saskatchewan, born and raised. So, and status-wise, you're you're dual citizen. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, here in America, I'm just American. In Canada, That's I'm right. a dual citizen. That's how I will. <laughs> That's how we like it, yeah. Yeah, we're okay with that. Um, okay, now we're on to the AT&T um, uh, episode that you did. Uh, Nick Wallet. Why would a switch reset itself for four seconds to relieve the pressure? Something about this doesn't make sense. Either the switch has available trunk lines and codecs, or it doesn't. If that's the case, it should respond to incoming requests accordingly. Going AWOL for a short eternity seems like a great way to make the problem much more worse. Well, I don't think it's resetting the entire switch in the sense of dropping calls. I think it's resetting the switch in the sense of, I'm not going to accept any new calls coming in at this point because I'm at or near capacity. So it broadcasts this message saying, hey, take me out of your destinations because I'm too busy right now. And once my call volume goes down to some threshold, let's say 75%, then I'll send a broadcast saying, okay, I can start taking more calls. I think that's what's going on, and that kind of makes sense to me. So I'm not sure. If you thought that it was dropping all the calls and punting them, I could see that would be a bad solution. But yeah, I think what they're doing makes kind of sense. Okay. AJ Meyer. Wasn't there a timing bug that caused a space shuttle launch to auto abort in the last second of launch sequence? He says if he recalls correctly, the shuttle had three guidance computers and all three had to agree in order to, for the launch to go. And if they didn't all agree in specific parameters, then the computers would abort the engine ignition. Does that ring any bells? For I don't know about that specific launch. I know the shuttle had actually five computers. So it had four in a voting block and then one that could replace any of the four. So a fifth was kind of a hot backup. And so the four voted, and I believe three had to agree. So what happens if one was dead and you've only got three left and two agree? I don't know. But I know that under normal circumstances, you had four voting of the five and three would agree at least. Um, and you're not, but yeah, not, not that specific any, launch. Yeah, not anywhere of any bug that caused the last second abort or anything, eh? No, and there's been a number of like cool space bugs that I'd like to do episodes about, like the <laughs> Mars Polar Orbiter. Uh, oh, yeah. That one lost because of a math error. The yeah. Ariane, Ariane 5 rocket blew up because of a math error. So there's a couple of those that are pretty cool. I don't know if we can Wasn't make Wasn't there a problem with one of the first space telescopes too? Yeah, that was a optics error. Right. So that was maybe, not necessarily a software error, but math on the grinding. <laughs> yeah, somebody typed it in wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, LG Bon, did the faulty break statement break from the switch statement or the while statement, or are both true? I believe it broke from the switch statement out to the while statement. Ah, um, so so it keeps not going both in that true, loop, but they're both but, related. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a comment on screen there that says break from the while, and it should be break to the while. Ah, so okay. if you were following the comments and the code on screen, it was backwards. Ah, maybe that's gone. Okay, Mick, I think it's McAndre. He's got a couple of numbers tucked in there that I'm supposed to read backwards. Um, why does the node have to restart every time it reaches capacity? Seems wasteful. Well, again, it's not restarting in the sense of throwing away all the calls. It's restarting in the sense of I'm going to not take new calls for a while. It, yeah. That's my understanding. So Let's just give me a break here for a second. Yeah. I gotta, I'm yeah. shutting down. It doesn't mean I'm yeah, throwing yeah. away all the calls. I'm just yeah. not taking anything new now. Yeah. Um, Maz G7Z or Z, depending on uh, 
Uh, great video as always, Dave. Could you react to Veritasium's video about how they used the SS7 to hack Linus Tech Tips? No. I haven't, haven't seen that seen episode. That? Yeah. I've seen the thumbnail about 8,000 <laughs> times in my stupid feed, and I refuse to watch it because it's too clickbaity. Um, no, I've said too much. But, uh, yeah, on principle, I have not watched that one. I'm sure it's a great video, and I like Veritasium, and yeah. Linus is cool too, but yeah. something about the thumbnail and, the, oh, we're going to hack your phone. I'm like, the best you're going to do is spoof caller ID, at best. If you could hack my cell phone... I would be more impressed than watching your YouTube video. But I don't I think, think that's someone happen. had asked a question about that too, how how people spoof phone numbers and stuff, but watch that video. I bet that's what they there do. You go. There you go. Watch the video and let us know if it does that. Uh Jeffrey seven B. Does Dave have friends involved in amateur radio? And has he ever found an interest in this activity? He might have an undiscovered talent for Morse code. Inquiring ham radio operators want to know. I don't. I had a friend who lived next to a guy who had a massive tower up in Vancouver. Um, that was the closest I ever got to it. Um, I remember Nolan Bushnell, the guy that started Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. He got into ham radio, and his rationale for doing so was that every time he made a hobby out of something, he would eventually turn it into a business, and so it ruined all his fun. But ham radio, you're basically legally prohibited from using it for commercial applications, so he got big into ham radio because he was prevented from taking it to commercial applications. So, um, which sounds terrible. I want to monetize everything. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my my Call ham now. radio, not, not that anyone cares. That the, the ham radio for me is Tom Hill across the street had the big tower in the backyard. And he was the first person that I ever knew that he got a Commodore pet. Okay. And he had a son that was three or four years older than me and a daughter two years younger, and when I heard he got that Commodore pet, I started hanging out with his daughter a lot more, knocking on the door and <laughs> yep, going down in the basement. He had his ham radio equipment and this Commodore pet, and man, that was my first exposure to it. It was just um, just burned in my brain. So I have a great affinity for ham radio operators just because of that association. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we're off to our uh, last uh, episode of uh, Dave's Attic here. Oliver W. Douglas, I enjoy the work you've done with the LEDs in your shop. Um, it's at all that stuff. Any suggestions for what language or platform to get acquainted with, which lends itself to LED and equipment control and management projects? Yeah, I would take a look at the Night Driver stuff we've done. So it's ESP32 based, and you can get some really nice turnkey modules with displays and every buttons and everything built right in. Uh, you don't even need to flash them yourself you can flash them from the web page at nightdriverled.com so that's where i would start nightdriverled.com and if you're into it you can hack the code yourself and contribute back and it does a lot of cool stuff all the led stuff in my background is powered by it so and that's in c plus plus yes yeah. some of the effects are generated on a pc in c sharp okay. but all the okay. microcontroller stuff is c plus plus okay um unwalled garden is night driver still being actively developed <laughs> That's kind of an interesting yeah. coincidence. Uh, yes. Right now, we're basically trying to get the UI for I, what I need are people that are good at C sharp WinForms coding. I have a pretty good start on a WinForms app, but uh, I don't have the time to work on it as much as it deserves. And then other people would be able to use it, create effects, define strips and sites and locations, and do all the stuff that you can't do with Night Driver now because you have to hard code it in a table. So, if you are a C Sharp WinForms programmer and you want a new challenge and you got some spare time, uh, shoot me an email, please. Shoot them an email, or send them one. Yep. Go through the, yeah, go through the channel. <laughs> channel about. Channel about. Oh, channel about. Yeah. <laughs> you know who else is from Regina, besides Deadpool? Who? Elon Musk's mother. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then he there worked in like Swift Current, Saskatchewan for a summer or something for some reason. S Speedy Creek. <laughs> yeah. I guess his grandfather's from Saskatchewan. Wow. And was like a big supporter. Remember the CCF, I think it was? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What was that? Um, Soviet Socialist Republics of so something? Yeah. What did <laughs> uh, I get? Uh, Cooperative like Something Federation. Yeah. 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 So oh, it was basically funny. socialist, but he was really super conservative and sort of anti some groups, and it wasn't strict enough for him, so he moved to South Africa where it was 
Uh, okay, Cole Simons. I sure hope I didn't miss this if you've already addressed it, but the subject, car stuff. Engine, excuse me, engine management, PLMs, ECUs, PicoScope, CAN bus, etc. Have you ever dipped your toe into that space? And again, a long time ago, you mentioned the reference fixing and transmission shifting bug, and we talked about that. He says, not enough of that on YouTube, especially with the treatment that you give things. So, you got some car stuff? Yeah, I'd love to do some. I'm just, you know, I've done fuel injection. I built my own. I've um, reprogrammed factory ones. I've done some CAN bus hacking. I built a thing to raise and lower the top on my M3 based on hitting the key fob three times, that kind of thing. And they would all be kind of cool little projects. The problem is, you know, when you do it, the way the YouTube algorithm seems to work is let's say that I get 200,000 people to watch a good video. And if a quarter of them are also car fans, well, now I get 50,000 people to watch the video. It doesn't add 200,000 car fans to my channel. It kind of narrows it down to the subsection of my audience that is also interested in cars. And so that's kind of the disincentive as a creator. Now, if I could make a good car-based, how does EFI work, and it appeal to a broader audience, I mean, I can certainly try that because that's intuitively how I think things should work, but that hasn't been my experience. So. Yeah. Yeah, the algorithm is um, in some ways not helping. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, the other translation is I just suck at it, but the point <laughs> is that I do what I do, and so I'm not going to be Mr. Beast, obviously. So yeah, yeah. I, I can't get too far out of my lane. Uh, Sean Wright, any chance we get any more content on that beautiful 2 plus 2? And I'm not sure which <clears> one he's referring to, but... <laughs> uh, he's probably seen the black one in the background. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, I am at some point planning on doing a mega episode on the 2 plus 2 because I've got another one, a convertible, out in restoration right now, and it's been in restoration for like five years. Uh, it's from Rusted Hulk to Concourse. So I want to do kind of a story of that car. It was a very rare, it's a one-of-one -one car built only in Canada with a Corvette motor and some weird options and stuff like that. So when I'm done, I'm going to do an episode on the restoration. And I'll also feature the black one that I've had for 50 years or since my dad has had it. My dad had it, you know, 20 years and then I've had it 30. So, And the 2 plus 2 convertible, you actually had one of those for a period of time too, a short frame. I did. I had a uh, yeah. red one. It was it, The only difference was it had a black top and a black interior and yeah. a small block. This one's a 427, uh, 390 yeah. horse, but, and a four-speed. Yeah, similar but totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Different in the ways that matter. <laughs> That's right. Um, Sean Wright. Uh, oh, same dude again. Uh, what's the reasoning behind splitting this out into another channel? <laughs> I think some of that's maybe answered in the question about the car stuff. The algorithm of things get a little bit um, weird. but Yeah, it's hard to throw a podcast-style episode into regularly scheduled channel episodes and have them not clash. And now YouTube says, well... Only 20% of the people like this podcast episode, and now only 20% of the people like this explainer episode because you've got clashing audiences. So I thought we'd try it on the smaller channel, see if we can grow an audience here. So again, good point to uh, do two things, of course, subscribe. And if you find this in any way interesting, shoot it to a friend because nobody's going to see it unless people, tell other to, unless people tell other people about it. So would appreciate if you do. And, and the big, I think, one, well, there's two two things, my understanding of the, the sort of the purpose behind this. One was you've got little sort of anecdotes and stuff that pops up or time that you can just sort of shoot out on this uh, thing at sort of the start. And then I think, the, again, the notion of people are asking a lot of questions uh, and have a lot of questions for you and they don't warrant full episodes. So, hey, we just collect them and, and answer them here. So this is a way of sort of just communicating back to folks and, and keeping that circle moving. And I think the having it on the second channel is a, a good way to sort of make that clean from that. But yeah. yeah. Well, it's been working so keep, well. Yeah, so. keep, yeah, keep pumping questions in and we pull them not just from, from the Shop Talk uh, uh, episodes on the Attic channel, but we pull them off your regular channel too. So... Um, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe folks will be a slow trickle to get into that, but there's all kinds of interesting stuff that comes out of here. And yeah, anyway, um, that's my two bits. Uh, and I did, oh, and I didn't look for it and I was going to, I know someone threw a question in there, but they didn't put a question mark. Uh -oh. And I saw it when I was reading through the comments, but it doesn't, 
uh, meet my criteria for right. recognize it a question. So I'm looking for question marks. So if you've got a question in any of Dave's stuff, whether it's on the attic or Dave's garage, put a question mark in it. That pulls it out. So I'll go I back. I stress take a that enough, and people. Put a question mark on your questions. Yeah, but darn it, now I'm going to go back and I'll have to run through the comments in all five episodes and find the question without a question mark. But uh, so I think it wasn't. It was a pretty good question too. Um, last question, uh, Michael Flood. Greetings from the United Kingdom. Have you two been friends forever? And Glenn, we know about Dave's background. What's yours? Um, <laughs> do you want to answer the Well, friends? let me tell you about Glenn. <laughs> yeah, well, we went to high school together, so we've known each other since grade nine. So yeah. we were 14, I guess. Uh, yep. So, yeah, that's pretty much forever. Yeah, and then there was a gap, and then we reconnected and found out we only live a couple hours apart from each other in two different countries, and yeah. 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 So what's your story? What's my story? Holy cow. So we know about Dave's background, my background. What I was saying, I'm a career um, civil servant, working municipal government. So Do you wear a suit? Uh, I, <laughs> when I got my first <laughs> office job, I did. Shirt yeah. and tie all the time when I was just a clerk. And then I'm like, this is municipal work. None of the other guys are wearing that. So, yeah. So I just, uh, and now it's gotten even worse. It's like golf shirts. I'm lazy. But so I've been a career municipal employee for more than 30 years, worked for the city of Saskatoon, city of Surrey and city of Vancouver for the last 22 years. So, and I'm not a, not a computer dude like Dave was exposed to computer stuff early, but I'm a, I'm an Excel guy and database stuff. And now when you say Excel around. guy, if I say V lookup, yeah, V well now it's X lookup and a couple of okay. other options, but yeah. So Compared to all the people around me, they think I'm the Excel expert, um, but that's because I know 5% and most people are working on two. Um, right. But uh, yeah, so as long as you're touching, you know, twice as much as everybody else, they think you're the guru. So, um, but I'm not uh, not confused at all. I know there's a tons of other stuff out there, but, but I know enough to be dangerous and I poke around and I'm curious about all this computer stuff and understand it probably a little bit less than most of your audience. But it's fascinating. You're a good sample then. Yeah. And I think that's sort of, I'm the foil for, for you to um, divulge all the knowledge that you have and answer these questions. So yeah, happy to play that role. Well, cool. Well, thanks for joining me out here tonight. And thank and you for having to, me. And thanks to everybody else for joining us. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time right here on Shop Talk. This little chair will be waiting for one of you and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.